may be seated. Faith and works go hand in hand. Trust, that's faith, and obey, that's works. Ah, that we might learn that, that genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. Let's turn now to Acts chapter 24. Tonight we're looking at pestilent Paul and pompous people. Try to say that fast five times in a row. <laughs> Acts chapter 24, verses 1 through 20, 21 tonight. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray that thou wouldest hear of us thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us, and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are but yet twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they found me in the temple, not just found, neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had aught against me. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice, that I cried among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Oh, Amen. Here is the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look into your word tonight, that you might cause your word to be that which examines us, not merely we who are examining your word. We pray, Father, that the light of the word of God might shine into our hearts to see where we fall in this category of people that we have strung out before us tonight. I would like to tell us a skilled orator and argument maker, like Felix, sort of jaded, like the Sanhedrin, like their lackeys who also assent, or like Paul, unashamed of Christ. Though it may get us into trouble as it did with him, but unashamed of Christ. We pray, Father, for your blessings on the word as it goes forth tonight, that you are hearts would be encouraged, that your name would be exalted, and that Jesus Christ would be glorified. 
for those who may be listening to this broadcast who are not saved, that they might trust in Christ. For those who are hearing what is said tonight, that are believers, that they might be edified and built up in the things of our Lord. That each of us would go forth from this place knowing that we have been encouraged by the Word of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I recall that last week, on the 13th, we looked at the second half of Bodyguard at Government Expense from chapter 23, verses 23 through 35. We finished up looking at the Jewish concept of work, which goes back to the creation mandate. We pointed out that Orthodox Jews view work as one of the first two basic commands of God. The first command was, as you recall, be fruitful and multiply. Therefore, welfare type of people are deeply despised as being in rebellion against the second and one of the two most basic commands of God by the Jews, even the Orthodox Jews today. The Orthodox Jews view those who refuse to work as rebellion against God. We looked at Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through uh, chapter 3, verse 19, the different places there where the creation mandate is standard, uh, stated. As to that creation mandate, we also noted that it's a shameful thing that in modern American church today, there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, who promote birth control and secular family planning rather than walking by faith and trusting God to give them the precise children of his choice. And I noted to you last week that you are not merely postponing children, you are directly eliminating specific children when you practice birth control that would otherwise be conceived and born. Only one egg and one sperm can form a specific individual child. Every child should be planned by God and not tried to be planned by man. God's timing is always best and I think I would much rather have God's choice than what I think that I choose. In the same way, the modern American church has put up with on that second part of the creation mandate the American church has put up with lazy non-working bums who should be thrown out of the church, politically shamed, publicly shamed, and then not let back in until they get a job. That they bring shame on the name of Christ. And we're talking, as we noted at that point, about people who really are saved. Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. I also quoted the rabbinic teaching last week that says that a man who does not teach his son a trade is as if he raised him to be a thief. The Orthodox rabbis still teach that and the Orthodox Jews still believe that. If you don't teach your son how to do something, you raise him to be a thief. The Jews also considered the lazy man, not just merely the man who didn't know a trade, but the lazy man who mooched off of others on the same level as a thief, and Paul alludes to that in Ephesians 4. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. In the Old Testament, the command simply said, Thou shalt not steal. The New Testament, under grace, goes farther than the Old Testament law ever could, but it also provides the empowerment necessary for fulfilling that command. It doesn't just say, Thou shalt not steal. It says, Let him labor. And it tells you what kind of labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. Not every job is fitting according to scripture. And then it doesn't stop there. It says that he may have to give to him that needeth. In other words, you're not merely make, working to make yourself rich. You're working for the purpose of giving. That goes a lot farther than the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments ever did, which simply said, thou shalt not steal. So the guy says, I didn't steal, but I get to keep everything I got, except, well, I know I'm required to give 10% to God, but here it's talking about not giving just 10% to God, although a believer should give more than 10% today, because we're under grace and we have far more blessing, therefore we ought to give more, not on the basis of law, but on the basis of love, and love always gives more than law requires, but giving to other believers as well as giving to God. The New Testament, when you examine it, has a lot of things to say to us that we don't like to hear. And in some cases, I think we'd much rather be back under the law, which restricts things. We don't have to do beyond the law. There's a good lesson here for girls and ladies. 
any girls that are listening, any young ladies that are here. Um, here's a good lesson. Never open your pocketbook for a man who refuses to get a job or who is constantly making an excuse as to why he can't support himself and so you need to give him money. If you don't learn that lesson, you'll spend your life financially supporting a man who will waste your hard-earned income. Another good lesson that we learn here. Never open your heart to a man who never opens his Bible. If he really knows his Bible, a lot of men pretend to know their Bible, they can give you all kinds of nice theological arguments, but if a man really knows his Bible, he won't be making excuses for why he can't get a job to support himself. You don't need to be his gravy train. Paul himself set the example, and Paul certainly was more qualified than any man on the face of the earth today. Paul got a job to support himself when he didn't have enough money. He was an apostle. He had more gifts than any man alive today. He had more training than any man alive today. He had better teachers than any man alive today. Paul himself set the example, even though he was not required to do manual labor to support himself, he said he did. We talked about that with Aquila and Priscilla. He made tents. That's manual labor. Paul says, and we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. In chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, verse 6, he says, where he's making an appeal to the church, and he says, don't you understand this principle? Is it only I and Barnabas? Don't we have the power to forbear working? Paul was supporting himself because the church at Corinth was carnal. The Bible teaches that vocational Christian ministry is genuine work for which a man should be paid. Men in full-time ministry are supposed to support or be supported by the church, even though they're willing to work at other jobs to support themselves. I've done that throughout my entire ministry, working at other jobs to support myself when the church couldn't support me. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And we talked about how that word translated honor there doesn't mean just saying nice things about the person, but actually paying them a double salary, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Paul applies that to those in full-time vocational Christian ministry. All those who are not in full-time ministry who refuse to work were to, shunned, were to be shunned by the church. Paul deals with that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We also saw that there are some things, we only went over them very briefly, but profitable work in the sphere of the home applies these principles to women as well as to men. God has ordained a specific sphere of work for women in the home. And he talks about those who don't. He talks about those who have enough to just sort of fiddle around and do nothing. In 1 Timothy 5.13, with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. The work of women is, or, is divinely ordained to be in the home. Look at the context of verse 13, which we just read. This is 1 Timothy 5, beginning at verse 11 specifically related to younger widows because as their husbands die, the husband would usually have been a worker who leaves something behind so the wife can be supported. That's the way it is today too. Most men have insurance policies so that if they kick the bucket, their wives will have money to take care of themselves. And so Paul writes, but the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking those things which they ought night, not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. And Paul tells us about those. Those are those who are age 60 and over and who are absolutely destitute and have no children or nephews or nieces to support them. And then we closed with 
the old saying is true, idle hands are the devil's workshop, and Peter talks about that in First Peter chapter 4, verse 15, that none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other ends matters. Men can be busybodies as well as women. So that brings us tonight to pestilent Paul and pompous people. Verse 1 of chapter 24. After five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And I know it's rather interesting. There's a, a very large silence in the text that I hope you noticed. There's a hole. There's a gap. Something didn't happen, and so something else should have happened. But even though we are very, very curious about what did happen, we don't know. God hasn't let us know. Maybe in eternity we'll get to know. But did it ever make you wonder, is what happened to the 40 assassins? Remember, those were guys who had taken a severe vow that they would neither eat nor drink until they killed Paul. So presumably, either they broke their vow not to eat anything until they killed Paul, or they died because you can't go forever without eating something. But God didn't see fit to tell us. God, though, did hear their vow. God knows what happened, and the book of Ecclesiastes tells you what happens to a man who breaks his vows. As we come to the text tonight, obviously some kind of planning session went on for five days at the Sanhedrin. And at this point, they have decided that the best plan is to put on a show of political power and hire a top gun attorney. Notice the setting here. Not just Ananias the high priest came, which would be very, very surprising for him to travel away from Jerusalem, except in a very, very important case. But in fact, he came to a Gentile ruler. Notice something else that says that all the elders came. In other words, that was all the senior officials on the Sanhedrin. That's like bringing an entire presidential or Supreme Court retinue to someone for a judgment. Number two, notice they didn't hire a Jewish lawyer. People make jokes about Jewish lawyers. There are a lot of them who are really good. But they didn't hire a Jewish lawyer because they were going to go before a Gentile judge. They hired somebody who had a, Ro a Roman name who actually brought the charges, Tertullus. Number three, we learn something about Tertullus by the specific term that is used to describe him. Tertullus is called an orator. The Greek word that's found here is hraitor. That is a forensic advocate trained in logic and argumentation. This is a very highly trained guy that they are having represent their case before Felix. A forensic advocate trained in logic and argumentation. Number four, in the Roman legal system, you had to be admitted to practice law before the court, just like today. This man had the training that was necessary. He had gone through the process necessary for admission before the court, as it were. He'd been admitted into the Bar Association for formal trial practice. If the entire Sanhedrin was involved as plaintiffs in the trial, they obviously did not hire a cheap beginner straight out of law school. Number five, interesting the word that's used here. It says that he informed the governor against Paul. The word informed is the Greek word emphanizo, which means to put on a display or an exhibit and do it in person. Just like lawyers today try to have exhibits to show the judge or the jury, this was something that Tertullus tried to do, but as we see later on, because Paul was also skilled, Paul knew how to answer those kinds of charges. Paul knew how to poke the holes in the argument of the enemy. Tertullus tried to do it, but he failed to accomplish it. You know, although sometimes it doesn't seem so, courts of law have strict standards for the admission of evidence. And Tertullus was weak on evidence, even though he was very strong on his oratorical skills. I'm sure some of you remember the O.J. Simpson trial. 
his legal team was trying to prove his innocence. And they had these catchy little phrases that would stick in people's minds so that they would think of those little phrases like, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. How many of you remember that? Yeah, yeah, you remember that, right? <laughs> oh, my. Here, Tertullus was making a concerted effort to prove guilt, not innocence. If we get his head, he will be dead. <laughs> Tertullus is doing his best. Verse 2 says, And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. He has a good foot forward with that little statement that he just made. The Roman courts were highly organized and orderly, even when some had corrupt judges. And we see a number of corrupt judges as we go through the book of Acts, people who are trying to be politically expedient so they won't have trouble on their watch, going all the way back to Pilate. We see this reflected throughout the entire book of Acts. Here, Tertullus was called forth to present his case. Our modern American legal system has its roots through the British common law, back to the Roman legal system. Rome ruled the British Isles for a time and deeply imprinted their legal system on what would become England. That, in turn, was brought to this country by our founding fathers. The oratorical skills of Tertullus are also worth noting. He goes to great lengths to be pleasant in front of the judge and to develop a favorable relationship by flattering Felix. He doesn't come across as nasty, negative, sullen, sulking, petty, complainer. He systematically lays the foundation, which is what you're taught to do in law school when you're presenting your case. And he does it in a very interesting way, not by presenting evidence, but by highlighting the positive character traits of Felix. And then he's going to accuse Paul of offending those specific character traits. We'll see that in just a second. First of all, he talks about peaceful tranquility. Now, you know, that was something that Felix really wanted. That was something that sounded good in the ears of every governor, especially those who had to function in the Middle East among the folks who were there, because as you know, even down till today, peaceful tranquility is not something that really characterizes the Middle East. So he talked about peaceful tranquility. And Tertullus is going to accuse Paul of disrupting that tranquility. Number two, he gives an almost unheard of compliment to Felix of Jews who are expressing a thankful or a grateful spirit to a Roman for good deeds done to the nation. That was something that Roman governors almost never heard. It says, you know, we are so thankful to you because by your very brilliant and skilled leadership, I mean, you are really doing good stuff for us. On the other hand, Tertullus is going to accuse Paul of unworthy deeds to the nation and thus an insult to the governor who does worthy deeds. Number three, this I think is very interesting here because Tertullus is walking a very tight, fine line on this point because of who his clients are. He gives flattering reference to providence. Notice that word in your text. In putting such a noble man over the Jews at this point in history, Providence did it. In contrast to Paul, whom they accuse of being pestilent, there is a difference between providence and pestilence. This is about as close as Tertullus can come to praising a pagan god without stepping over the line and violating the sensitivities of his clients, the high priest and the Sanhedrin. You see, the Greeks and the Romans both believed in providence and worshipped various gods and goddesses who brought it about as argued by both Cicero and and Seneca, both who spoke of providence as higher god or goddess than fate or chance. Both Cicero and Seneca argued that there was enough evidence to deny that blind chance or fate, also worshipped as gods, were actually the deciders of human history, but that there was an, it's been called even in modern American times, an invisible hand at work that could be discerned by reason. Verse 3, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with thankfulness. In other words, we are really a grateful people. Now, from what you know about the Sanhedrin, <laughs> about the high priest, 
If you were going to list the ten most grateful people that you have ever heard about, would they be on that list? The ten most thankful people for all the good that is being done to them. This guy is stretching the point. We accept it always and in all places. All that good stuff. Most noble Felix. You got class. You got rank. And we are so thankful. You know, Tertullus is doing something here that is very powerful. And we could learn a lesson from it, though not to use it the way he did. But Tertullus does what every person wants to hear and feel. He expresses what I call an attitude of gratitude. Let that little phrase stick in your mind. If the glove don't fit, it must acquit. Well, think about an attitude of gratitude. You know, that's what everybody wants to hear. People don't like to be taken for granted. People don't like to be ignored or overlooked. People don't like to have you say, oh, well, he owed it to me anyway. Well, that was nice. You know, there was a, a story I heard once, and I think it's a true story. My dad spoke on it, but it's a long time ago, and so I don't remember all the details. But um, about a person in the church who came up demanding something, and my dad reminded them of certain things that he had already done for them. And you know what their response was? Yeah, but what have you done for me recently? Have you ever run into people like that? Yeah, I've run into a few. An attitude of gratitude. Here's Tertullus expressing it to Felix. You know, it's amazing how far you can get in life with an attitude of gratitude and how many things you lose for failing to have an attitude of gratitude. For example, a man or a woman who takes his or her spouse for granted and feels that the spouse what they're doing is it's to be expected anyway or required of the spouse. That man is soon going to have marriage troubles or that woman is soon going to have marriage troubles. Why do husbands often fix plumbing for neighbors and others and let the same things go unnoticed at their own homes, even if the wife nags them constantly, even if the wife writes them notes, even if the wife, you know, goes into the bathroom and lets the sink leak all over the floor? Why will they go over to the neighbor's house and help them with their problems and not take care of things at home? You know, it's usually because the neighbor is very grateful, but the wife only nags and nags until it gets done. And then she says, well, it's about time that you did that. <laughs> Have you ever known anybody like that? Men and women learn the lesson now. Learn to express gratitude to your spouse in a tangible way. It will go a huge way in making for a happy marriage. That principle applies across the board at work. You know, expressing appreciation for what your boss does for you instead of saying, it's about time he gave me a pay raise. Or expressing appreciation for the employee who did something very well for you and really made your life a lot easier. Don't just say, well, I hired him to do that. The expression of thankfulness. Did you know that's one of the things that God looks for, and if it doesn't come, he'll give you trouble. Romans chapter 1. It talks about the pagans. It says, who, when they knew God, glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. When you're not thankful, it does something to your mind, and it tells you in the next part of the verse, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. They thought that all the good stuff, they deserved it. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Failing to have thankfulness only darkens your spiritual life. And then it describes the list of sins into which they fell because they didn't give glory to God and they didn't give thanks to God. Praise where it belongs, thanksgiving when it's due. 
God has given us one another to practice on so that we'll learn how to do it in relation to him. Across the board, work, school, friendships, and all other forms of interpersonal relationship. Now back to our text. Verse 4. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear of us, us of thy clemency, a few words. <laughs> Did you pick up on it? Tertullus is using a little debate trip, trick, an attention grabber in this verse. The one word people like to hear most of all is their own name. The one subject that they like to hear most about is themselves, as long as what they're hearing is a compliment. It's almost hilarious what Tertullus says here, that I be not further tedious unto thee. <laughs> you can almost hear Felix thinking to himself, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, go on, go on, I like what you're saying. Nobody ever says nice things like that about me. You're not tedious. In fact, I was almost ready to invite you over for lunch. Look at verse 4. Three things are happening in this verse. Number one, Tertullus also does something else to win Felix over. This is also something that will always help to win others. He expresses humility. I pray thee. He's begging a favor. Now, this is a powerful orator. I mean, you may not pick up on this. We didn't hear him speak. We didn't see his hand gestures. He was a very eloquent man. He wouldn't have been hired if he wasn't. Certainly not hired by the high priest in Sanhedrin to go before a Gentile Roman governor. They wanted somebody who was good, and they could pay for somebody who was good. He expresses humility. Number two, he gives a character comment to Felix, hear us of thy clemency. Clemency means mercy. You know, a lot of people praise you for externals. Oh, you are so beautiful, or you are so handsome, or I just, oh dearie, I just love that dress you're wearing. Rather than praising us for internal character qualities that express true beauty, true stability, true integrity, true godliness, true holiness. I've tried for a very long time when I've complimented my children to praise them not merely for their talents, but to praise them for making right choices, to praise them for standing alone in the face of opposition when they stood for that which was right. I had the privilege of encouraging one of my sons within the last two or three days because in contradiction to all of his friends, he took a stand in this current election for a man whom he truly believed would be in the best interest of this country and who stood for principle, not merely pragmatism. And he took a lot of flack for it. And when I heard about it, I sent him an email and told him how proud I was of him because he had stood for righteousness and truth. Dear people, that's where we need to praise our kids and one another is for their integrity, for their honesty, for their truthfulness, for reflecting the character of Christ, for manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, the things that are lovely, the things that are good, not the things that are external, not the things that the worldlings try to make you think are the important things. For mercy and judgment and justice. Tertullus understands that as he comes to Felix. He understands that at the deepest level, 
what a man or a woman really needs to hear is where they have made the right choices. Now, he's using it as a manipulative tool. Never use it as a manipulative tool. That's sinful. Telling something about someone else to them that isn't really true of them, but they would like to think that of themselves. Felix obviously wanted to think that of himself. Tertullus understands human nature. But when you see something good in the life of another person, take a moment to tell them how much you appreciate seeing Christ in them. He gives a character compliment to Felix. Hear us of thy clemency or of thy mercy. <laughs> and then he did something that this preacher almost never does. He promised to be short. <laughs> He says, in a few words. Now, you know, all of this is before he launches his attack against Paul. He's done everything in his power at this point to win a positive verdict for his clients without even beginning to make the charges and present the evidence. Verse 5. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. The accusations here are broken down into four categories. I hope you picked up on that. And he is claiming that these categories have been supported by the trial court at the lower level. Just like their trial courts and appeals courts in the American legal system, Tertullus is trying to place this event into that same kind of a framework. The problem is that the original trial court was Jewish and not Roman. And that there was a split decision with no winner. And there was an attempted assassination and an escaped prisoner. He leaves out some rather important facts. You know, that wasn't quite standard for Roman law. The categories that Tertullus hopes the governor will support without examining the facts are these four. Number one, Paul is a troublemaker by nature. That is, he's a pestilent fellow. That's in contrast to what he's just said about Felix. We love your peaceful tranquility. Number two, Paul is a mover of sedition. Very carefully chosen words. He's trying to overthrow the Roman government. In other words, treason. You know, it's the same charges that the Jews tried to bring against Jesus when they brought him in front of Pontius Pilate, and Pilate didn't buy it. Pilate himself talked to Jesus. They said, anybody who makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. As if they had never spoken against Caesar. Come on, give me a break. We like all the things that you as a Roman have done for our nation, but Paul is a mover of sedition. Number three, he affects not only your jurisdiction, but he's spreading this treason throughout the Roman Empire. He says, throughout the world. They knew about some of Paul's missionary journeys. He'd gotten pretty far, but he hadn't gotten all the way around the world yet. But hey, do you realize how bad this guy is? I mean, this is just not just a local problem. This is a problem that affects the whole world. But he's under your authority, so you need to do something about it. Number four. You know, this guy, he's not just a munchkin in the movement. He is a ringleader of the Nazarenes. <laughs> in their minds, at least, that was sort of like being a ringleader with ISIS. After all, by using that term Nazarenes. See, they were first called Christians at Antioch, but at this point they're being called Nazarenes, the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. After all, I mean, by saying that, what they're drawing the attention of Felix to is the fact that Rome has already found the sect to be criminal. Because under Roman law, and with a former Roman governor, with a Roman trial, and a Roman execution, the founder of this sect, the Nazarene, was crucified as a criminal. 
Do you see the kind of logic that Tertullus is using here? We don't think much of it. We read right over it. But he is using some powerful arguments in the context of that particular trial at that particular point in history. But now come the real charges. We're almost out of time. Verse 6. Who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. They're the real charges. We don't get to them until after all that gobbledygook that he starts off with and all of the in innuendo and insinuation and accusations of the preceding verse. He's gone about to profane the temple. Okay, let's just stop there. Let's suppose everything else is out for a moment. Did Paul go to Jerusalem to profane the temple? Paul's been out among Gentiles, and so he thinks to himself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back and I'm going to do a number on the temple. Boy, I'm going to go in there and I'm really going to mess up the temple. I'm going to graffiti all the walls. I've just bought me a bunch of Greek magic markers, indelible kind, and I'll go in there and write slogans on the walls about how bad the high priests are. I'll write slogans on the wall about how the God of Israel is no longer the God of Israel. I'll go in there and on the temple doors I'll write the name Zeus. Was that what Paul was doing? No, and Paul will easily be able to answer this as we'll see in the last half of the text tonight. Because they'll say, you know, they've made some charges. They've said I've had a trial. They say that at the trial the evidence was presented and that the conclusion that the trial court reached was I'm guilty. However, they can't prove a word that they have said. And Felix will see that, of course, as we get a little farther here. Who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took <laughs> and would have judged according to our law. Did they actually take him? Well, they tried to. They tried to kill him. But he got rescued and would have judged according to our law. In other words, what they're saying is we've done everything legally. On the up and up. Psst, don't mention the assassins. They're accusing his underling of breaking the law. Lysias, the chief captain, is the one that needs to be straightened out. But the chief captain, Lysias or Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. We were just having a peaceful little trial and Lysias came in there and beat us up. Is that the way that it was? commanding his accusers to come unto thee. What an awful thing to tell us to have to do. By examining of whom, speaking of Paul, thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And they understood a principle in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established. And so verse 9 says, and the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Does that make it so just because a bunch of people say it? Have you ever been in a situation where somebody accused you of something and everybody else was nodding their head? I've been in situations like that and I think to myself, man, what a bunch of hypocrites. One person heard it from somebody else and then somebody else heard it from somebody else and so they all agree it must be true and they don't have any evidence to prove it. The Jews also assented saying these things were so. I'm tempted to go on to Paul, but there's too much. Verses uh, 10 through 21 as to how Paul addresses it. But this is a legal trial, folks. If you know anything about the law, and I've tried to give you some hints on that, you'll understand what's going on because someday, I hate to say this, someday I may be on trial for being a Christian. Someday you will be on trial possibly for being a Christian as the old saying goes will there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian there was certainly enough evidence to convict Paul of being a Christian in fact he admits it openly in court but there was nowhere near enough evidence to prove what they were trying to prove and you know something when push comes to shove, 
in a system like ours, they will have to find something else to shut you up. And they will usually make it up to do so. Well, we're going to stop there tonight. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We learned some very practical things here in this text tonight. Things that will be very profitable for us here if we've listened carefully to understand something about how pagans function even in a strong legal system and how they will function certainly in a system that's not as strong. Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that you've promised if any of us lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven of the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So, Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will apply it to the hearts and lives of each one of us here present and those who are listening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight is number five.